And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Chef Canarsi. Mob Talk Radio. I am your host, Jeff Canarsi. So where have I been? It's been a long time, uh, a couple months anyhow. Uh, for those that know, those that don't, I, I really don't want to go into the details about why I, I sort of was off the air, because I think it's been fairly well documented at this point. Uh, but I got the green light uh, from my bulldog attorney, so uh, we're back doing the show. And there's going to be a lot of changes uh, in the format of the show that are going to come down the line. But for now, coming out of the gate, we're going to do a couple of shows. Uh, eventually, we're going to move over to like a live call-in kind of deal, uh, which I'm sure is going to be absolutely aggravating to no end. Uh, but we're also going to add videos and, and stuff like that. So, so some things are going to change, but you can always expect kind of the same thing here. So we got a lot of stuff to cover like before we get into the show. And the show today is about Roy DeMeo and the DeMeo crew. There's a couple other things I wanted to talk about first. The, the, the first thing really honestly is uh, the, the John Gotti movie that is coming out, I believe, December 15th. I, I might get the day wrong there, but I, I believe that's the way it is on the 15th. Uh, from what I understand, uh, the editing's done, the film score is done. So I would expect a trailer to probably come out in the next couple of weeks, especially you got to get out ahead of the storm a little bit. And uh, give yourself some, um, you know, some viewing capabilities before the movie comes out. Also, there is a Gotti family documentary that was filmed by A and E, which I believe is done. Uh, they may be adding a couple more things. The original release date for that was in November, but I believe they're pushing that back as well. And, and that's going to be an important watch uh, for any mob genre uh, fan, or even if you're an author. Uh, 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 or, or somebody that's going to do podcasting, it's going to be an all-access, no-holds-barred kind of thing. It's going to be unlike any documentary you have ever seen on the Gotti family. So if you're looking to kind of get past the uh, the press headlines in the New York Post and, and sort of kind of catch a glimpse of what the family dynamic is, this is definitely going to be the project that you're going to want to watch. Like I said, I don't have a date for that, uh, but I know it got pushed back from November. So, you know, everything sort of kind of comes together in the end, especially when you're packaging or you're branding something uh, like a huge film. Uh, they, they, they try to package everything kind of together in a short span of time. Maybe it'll be after the film is released. Who knows? But you're definitely going to want to check that out. Also, I, I want to preface this by saying this first. Uh, William DeMeo. Uh, is in no way, shape, or form related to Roy DeMeo. It's just similar last name. But I wanted to kind of talk about, just for a second, uh, he's working on a TV show called uh, The Neighborhood, uh, which he's directing, acting in, uh, and everything else. Uh, if you don't know who he is, check him out on Facebook, William DeMeo. He also plays Sammy DeBull Gravano in the Gotti movie. Uh, incredibly gifted actor. Uh, All-around nice guy from what I understand. I've never met him personally, but he is shooting a mob uh, drama in Bensonhurst, which sort of circulates around the 1980s mob mafia and, and what it was like in Brooklyn in the 80s. So if you're nostalgic in any kind of way, you definitely want to check out his project. Uh, you can go on Facebook and check him out. I believe he's on Twitter and everything else. So where are we with the mafia today? Uh, I could talk about Canada for hours. I could talk about a lot of things, but I just wanted to give a quick update on Philly for the listeners who aren't following us over on our blog, which you can catch me on Twitter at Real Mob Talk 7. Uh, you can go into Facebook and uh, type in Mob Talk Radio, uh, and that'll pull up our Facebook page as well as it'll pull up our blog, which is Mob Talk Radio True Client. it true crime blog uh, where we have in-depth articles and uh, stuff like that but in Philadelphia it's pretty much the same looks like Joey Merlino is going to definitely walk from these charges the crux of the issue really has become the mob rat John Rubio 
Uh, the argument is how did he make the tapes? Why weren't the tapes handed in in, in a timely manner? Uh, why was it that the audio device that the FBI gave John Rubio? How come there are whole snippets of conversations and videos that have been deleted? So at the end of the day, that's probably going to be the thing that allows Joey Merlino to walk. So that's where we kind of stand on Philadelphia. It, the numbers are getting big there. Uh, there is definitely a resurgence in Philadelphia. So it, just keep keep your eye on Philly because I think that that's, that's a really good gauge for, I think, how things are going. Uh, but you can check out our blog for all that information and, and go online and, and look that up for yourself. I don't want to get into a whole diatribe on Philadelphia today. But it looks like uh, Joey Merlino is definitely, definitely going to walk. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we are going to talk about the Roy DeMeo crew. Now, the one thing I'm not going to do, <laughs> excuse me, is I'm not going to go tit for tat, name everybody from the crew and do a whole biographical sort of thing on them I, it's going to take too much time to do that and i kind of like to get everybody in the classroom teach what i got to teach and let them get out and enjoy their day so that's what we're going to try to do today so if i miss something or maybe i don't talk specifically about one member of the crew over the other don't take it personally it's just that we're allowed so much time here and i think really when you're talking about the DeMeo crew there, there's a couple of things that come into to play in that and i think roy DeMeo really is probably the main guy we have to talk about but just to appease those that are going to complain, because I always get complainers, death threats, and the usual, just just to, just to suffice to suffice them. I will talk about Anthony Center because I do know Anthony Center. At least I did for a long time. Uh, that didn't that friendship or whatever you want to call it didn't exactly end on the nicest terms. Uh, it was a little scary. Maybe I'll maybe I'll go into kind of what happened with him and myself along with Angela Clemente. There was there was a bunch of people involved in it. So stick right here. We'll be right back and we'll get to Roy DeMeo and the Roy DeMeo crew. Back to Mob Talk Radio. Now, who is Roy DeMeo? Uh, depending on who you ask, some people say he was a good, great earner. Some people say he was a, a psychopath. It, it really just depends on who you're going to talk to. Of course, the FBI is going to tell you he's a psychopath. But in the mob life, you're either good at one thing or you're good at another. If you can't earn, then you got to be able to be a tough guy in the streets. Roy was both. He was able to earn and be a tough guy in the streets. So who exactly was in the Roy DeMeo crew? Uh, obviously, uh, Nino Gaggi oversaw the Roy DeMeo crew. There was Roy DeMeo, Joseph Guglielmo, Chris Rosenberg, Anthony Center, Joey Testa, Edward Grillo, Dirty Henry Borelli, Richard DeNome and Freddie DeNome, Dominic Montiglio, Vito Arena, and Robert Center. Now, Robert Center was Anthony's uncle. And what makes sort of his story kind of strange is he was directly responsible for the killing and the murder of Carlo Gambino's uh, nephew, Manny Gambino. Uh, he essentially was partners with Jimmy McBratney, and he and McBratney essentially kidnapped Manny Gambino, held him for ransom, then murdered him. So we all know kind of how that story goes, and I, I really don't want to get into all of that. But it's just kind of strange that they allowed this guy to hang around, especially after he was sort of accused and ultimately, at the end of the day, convicted for that type of stuff. So when exactly did Roy DeMeo uh, get on the scene? Uh, Roy DeMeo was born in 1942 in uh, Bath Beach, Brooklyn. Uh, as a youth, he was picked on a whole lot, and he ended up uh, using lunch money to effectively become a loan shark, and he became so good at that by 17 it was a full-time job. 
uh, between that and his auto theft business, uh, loan sharking, it, it ended up catching the attention of Nino Gaji at the time. And through Gaji, uh, Gaji kind of realized that, that DeMeo had some earning capabilities and, and he was willing to be violent. And so he brought Roy kind of into the family uh, to work directly for Nino Gaji and the Gambinos. In 1966, Roy DeMeo bumps into Chris Rosenberg, who at the time was selling drugs uh out of a gas station and he was like a small time car thief so Roy was kind of attracted to him in the sense that he saw this potential in this kid to be able to to make some money with him uh, so what Roy ends up doing with Chris is he ends up loan sharking money to Chris so that Chris can buy larger amounts of drugs and in return he would get some protection and a cut of the profits so if you look at it in terms of was it a smart move for him? I think ultimately at the end of the day, it was probably one of the worst mistakes Roy made. But at the time, you know, here's this guy, he's selling, he's moving a little weight on the corner. Let me loan him some money. He's going to pay me back to VIG every week. Plus, I'm going to get a cut of the profits. It just kind of made sense for him to go ahead and do that. But eventually, uh, Chris's drug profits enabled Chris to open up a somewhat semi-chop shop called Carphobia Repairs. Uh, and he ended up recruiting Anthony Center and Joey Testa, who he kind of grew up in the neighborhood with in Canarsie. So that's how Joey and Anthony were kind of brought into this through Chris. Uh, DeMeo ultimately, as he started to make a little bit of money here and there, he ended up joining a bank called the Borough of Brooklyn Credit Union. And what he did was he used his power to gain a position on the board of directors. And then what he began to do was sort of pilfer money to launder through illegal businesses. And he would also go to other drug dealers and, and have them uh, launder illegal profits through the bank and stuff like that. So at the end of the day, you know, being a, on the board of directors of a bank really enabled Roy access to a lot of funds and it allowed him access to sort of reach out to other people in the community that were doing not so many good things to, uh, come in and, and funnel their money that way. Uh, he would also use the bank's money to build up his loan sharking business. So when people would come and ask for an insane amount of money, rather than pull out of his pocket, he would just simply pull out of the bank. Uh, like I said, he would bank drug dealers, uh, front money and, and stuff like that for, for high interest rates. So it was really, uh, really, when you think about it, I mean, from, from a perspective, and I'm not arguing morality here, but from the perspective of being highly intelligent, that, that's a pretty... That's a pretty decisive move for a guy like that. Uh, in 1974, there was sort of a conflict. Roy had uh, his, his car theft business was slowly going, and Anthony Center, by all accounts, from age, uh, I think before he was 14 years old, he had been arrested something like 15 times for auto theft, and that was Anthony Center's real calling was auto theft. He was very good at it. Uh, he was able to teach the other guys how to steal cars. And so when they started stealing the cars, they would bring them to the chop shops and, and they would sell parts and stuff like that. But there kind of was a problem. Roy had a, a silent partner named Andre Katz. And Katz's essential job was to help move the auto parts to, to other countries and to other people who were looking for stuff. But the problem was is that Andre Katz seemed to believe that Roy DeMeo was sort of cutting him out of profits. So in 1975, Roy DeMeo had enough, uh, and he started to get whispers from the police that Katz had gone to the police and started feeding them information. And so DeMeo, doing what DeMeo does, uh, had him kidnapped, murdered, and dismembered. Now, he was supposedly the first victim of the DeMeo crew. Uh, as far as whether they use the Gemini method, and we'll get into the Gemini method here shortly later, but uh, he was really the first guy the DeMeo crew whacked, and, and, and it had more to do with money than anything, plus the fact that this guy was sort of snitching on everybody. So, you know, Roy did what he had to do. Um, Joey Testa and Henry Borelli eventually would get arrested for the murder of Andre Katz, but they would eventually get acquitted. Uh, then in 1975, uh, Roy became a silent partner in a peep show and uh, prostitution establishment in New Jersey. Uh, what DeMeo essentially was doing was he was taking bootleg pornography and uh, selling it all over the place, mainly in New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island. But the thing that really caused a problem with him and Nino at that time because there would be more problems to come in the end. But what really caused a problem at the time was Nino looked at that as like lowbrow shit. He didn't want anybody dealing pornography. It was a dirty business. Uh, and, and he essentially told Roy, knock off the pornography shit. 
or I'm going to kill you. That's the end of the. That's the bottom line here. Is you continue to do this, you continue to sell drugs, you continue to deal in pornography, you will be killed. And you know, Roy being Roy ignored it and said, "Yeah, whatever." And and really, at the end of the day, it, it really became. Anino didn't like it, but he didn't mind taking the the profits from it either. So Roy kind of continued to uh, keep doing what he was doing. Uh, but that's just kind of the nature of the business. I think we've seen this a million times, and, and I could get into the – and we will get into it in this show uh, as far as the selling of the drugs and, and the unwritten rule that really wasn't an unwritten rule as long as, as, long as the profits were good. So in 19, as 1975 starts to close, the IRS uh, goes after Roy DeMeo, and they try to indict him. Uh, and he ends up sort of getting away from that charge, uh, and he – Business at the time for Roy was going really well, so he ended up uh, adding a car business to his growing legal enterprises, which was called Team Auto Wholesalers, which they also used uh, as a chop shop and and stuff like that. Uh, He would also add Danny Grillo to the mix and Matty Riga to his growing crew. So along the way, as he's building his illegal enterprises and legitimate enterprises, he begins to recruit more and more people to the crew. In 1976, Carla Gambino dies and Paul Castellano takes over. This was an up and up for Roy. Uh, Roy was trying to get made, but Castellano kind of thumbed his finger at street guys. He never liked street guys, and the record speaks for itself that, that Paul was never a street guy. Uh, himself. Paul didn't like doing dirty work. Paul looked at himself as like a, a businessman. And so he looked down on everybody that was a street level guy. So essentially when Paul Castellano takes over, it was good for Roy because Nino Gaggi would all of a sudden be up to a captain and he would take over Paul's old crew, which means he would oversee the DeMeo crew as well. And Roy was hoping that with Nino Gaggi, especially getting the bump up to Capo, that the books would open and he would get you know his due. He would be a made guy. But Paul Castellano didn't open the books. He simply just pr- promoted existing members. Uh, and, and like I said, Castellano was opposed to making DeMeo for a couple of reasons. One, he was afraid of DeMeo. He felt like DeMeo was uncontrollable and he was a street-level nobody. Uh, and 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 that was that was a big problem. You know, Roy's bringing in a lot of money for the family. He's doing things that the family requests of him, and Paul doesn't want to make him because Paul doesn't feel like he can control him. So what DeMeo needed was a plan, and simply what his plan was was he figured, you know what, I can murder, I can make money, but if I'm making a truckload of money or a fuckload of money, as I like to say, then Paul may not have any other choice but to make him. So what DeMeo does is he goes out and visits the Westies. If you're not familiar with the Westies, you can look it up, but they're basically uh, Irish gangsters from Hell's Kitchen, Jimmy Coonan, Mickey Featherstone, Mickey Spillane. You can look all that information up for yourself. Uh, but after after Mickey Spillane uh, was, was killed by Jimmy Coonan, Roy DeMeo sort of approaches them and, and kind of gets a feeling on where they stand on things. And Roy thinks, you know, if we can control them, bring them into the family, not only is it good for business, but it's good for money. And he takes it to Nino, and he talks Nino into saying, you know, listen, this might be a good idea. Let's 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 talk to Paul and, and see if Paul will go along with this, with this idea. We can use them for murder. We can get a kickback from their drug rackets to their gun sales and in order for protection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what essentially happens is Paul, Paul Castellano sits down, meets with Jimmy Coogan, excuse me, Jimmy Coonan and Mickey Featherstone, and what they sort of came, what they brokered was that the Westies would sort of become an arm of the Gambinos, not not essentially in the Gambino family, but just sort of another uh, subdirectory, I guess. I, I don't know another phrase to uh, to really use there. Uh, and what the deal was is that the Westies would become a, essentially an arm of the Gambinos in Hell's Kitchen in exchange for uh, protection, 10% of the profits. And the Westies would have to kill for the Gambinos if they asked. However, there had to be permission for them to kill anybody. That was one of the big thing. And in return, uh, you know, the Westies would be protected a bit, and they would also get a percentage of lucrative union deals. So it was a win-win as far as Jimmy Coonan was concerned. It, it gave them sort of more protection, allowed them to make more money. It sort of gave them the ability to do what they wanted, which is exactly what they would go ahead and do. But the thing is, is that at the end of the day, and as we move forward in this is story, is the the Westies really 
were a big part of the downfall of Paul Castellano, along with DeMeo. So, whereas it might have been a smart move, like in the very infant stage, infancy stage of this, it, it ultimately was their undoing. But these series of events of, of bringing the Westies in sort of kind of got Paul's attention. And in 1977, Roy DeMeo officially is made into the Gambino crime family. He is put in charge of overseeing the Westies. Uh, but a part of that deal was, you know, Paul had said to Roy, you know, listen, <laughs> end of the day, you can you can take your profits, whatever, everything comes to the top, but you cannot kill anyone without permission from me. So that being the major rule, that was the one sticker. It, it didn't matter if Roy kind of sold drugs on the side as long as the profits were good, but if he killed anybody without any permission, there would be hell to pay. And essentially, um, Roy ignored every single thing that Paul Castellano said. Uh, Paul Castellano has a history of saying no drug dealing. Anybody who drug deals in this family, they die. It goes back to Carlo Gambino. But what a lot of people don't realize and what a lot of mob experts don't tell you is that Carlo Gambino had two cousins that worked out of Cherry Hill, New Jersey, who were selling heroin. They had their own small little Sicilian crew there selling drugs. Paul Castellano, when... Uh, after Gambino died, Paul Castellano put even more guys in New Jersey to sell drugs. So the idea, the very idea that Paul Castellano was against drugs is bullshit. He had, he may have been on the record or off the record saying, you know, don't get caught because he never complained about the profits. You know, this guy would pinch the quarter till the eagle screams. I'm sure you've heard that in a lot of different movies and a lot of other people say that, but that's the truth of it. The profits is what he wanted. He didn't want to know what anybody was doing. And, you know, that also kind of goes to something else that I kind of want to bring up on the side. This whole Angelo Ruggiero not giving up uh, them fucking tapes, okay? And this goes back to this is what the huge beef was. The beef was is that Angelo Ruggiero was caught on tape talking about selling drugs. He had talked about a lot of people. That's public knowledge, okay? But here's the thing that nobody talks about, and this is the God's honest truth. Paul Castellano went to Della Croce and says, I want those tapes. Give me those tapes. So John Gotti and, and, and uh, Neil Della Croce, they stall. They don't want to give up the tapes. They're trying to protect Angelo. The thing is, is what nobody reports is Paul Castellano already had those tapes. He knew what Angelo had said. So this was simply just a matter of looking at Neil saying, who do I trust here? Do I trust you? Are you going to do the right thing by me? You've been around this business for a long time. So are you going to protect Angelo and John Gotti? Or are you going to do what the boss says? And that's all that was ever ever about. That's all it will ever be about. And if you if you accept that and you, you see that as facts for what it is, then you can sort of in a roundabout way, and I'm not making a moral argument whatsoever here, but you can sort of kind of understand why things happen the way they did. He says one thing does another. But Carl, another example, Carlo Gambino would take like 15% of the profits from all his men. Paul Castellano wanted 40% plus. He was strangling the guys on the streets. So when you, when you see that for what it is, it sort of makes what every so-called mob expert and former FBI agent, when they say things like, you know, uh, you know, Angelo Ruggiero, this, that, and the third, what they don't realize is that, you know, Paul Castellano had the tapes. He knew what was on them. He, it was just a simple matter of testing the fucking loyalty of people. And that's what that was all ever about. So, like, when he tells DeMeo, don't sell drugs or the penalty's death, what he really means is make sure the profits are right and I don't want to know what you're doing. And, and that's essentially what it really comes down to. So after DeMeo gets made, he gets in charge of the Westies. Uh, he sort of just does whatever he wants. Uh, he continues to sell coke, pot, pills, uh, and then he starts committing unsanctioned murders. Uh, anybody that got in his way, he murdered, he dispatched, and he got rid of, uh, all underneath the nose of Paul Castellano. And I can't imagine that, that Paul, especially considering Paul didn't want to make him to begin with, is it any surprise that DeMeo, you know, he, he said DeMeo was uh, uncontrollable. So is it any surprise that the DeMeo starts killing people at random? No, absolutely not. In 1999, there was a double murder of Jonathan Quinn and Sherry Golden. Both were killed for the assumption that they were rats. Uh, Roy DeMeo had gotten some feedback or started to assume that these two were rats. So essentially what Roy DeMeo does is he has them killed and he dumps their bodies on the street as a warning to everybody else of, this is what happens when you become a fucking rat. In 1978, uh, Roy DeMeo b 
begins to subcontract the DeMeo crew to other mob families, murder for hire, stuff like that. Uh, he would charge $5,000 a hit, or he would do what he called professional favors for other mob families. Uh, but the thing is, is that when, when you have a lucrative business, especially when you're, you're, you're stealing cars, moving them to Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, which we are going to get into, uh, you start subcontracting yourself out as hitmen to other families. You know, you're really putting yourself on a thin line. And I don't think Roy necessarily needed to do that uh, in order to, to, to keep the power base. But that, that ultimately, at the end of the day, was going to be his undoing as well. Uh, in 1978, at the tail end of 78, Freddie Denome joins the crew. Uh, he was a great car guy. He was a former race car driver. Uh, was a psychopath like the rest of them. Uh but also, right after Freddie Denome joins the crew, uh, they kill Danny Grillo. And the reason why Danny Grillo was killed was because he was in debt to Roy. He had been borrowing money uh, from Roy to, to, to buy drugs and sell drugs, and he essentially stopped paying Roy. He wasn't paying Roy the VIG every week. Roy got tired of it. So the crew started feeling like, you know, he's not going to pay the money that's owed, so what we're essentially going to do here is we're going to get rid of him, and that's... Uh, pretty much I exactly what they did. Uh, now, as far as the Gemini method, we're going to talk about the Gemini method for just a second, and then we're going to take a short break. Uh, the Gemini method, unfortunately, is pretty infamous. Uh, in case you don't know, in Canarsie, there was a bar called the Gemini Lounge, which is where Roy DeMeo worked out of. That's also where they killed a lot of people. And essentially, the Gemini method was that a victim would be ushered in through the door, and he would be shot with a silenced gun. A towel was then wrapped around the wound. Another crew member would step in with a butcher knife and stab uh, the victim in the heart, which would constrict the blood flow to the wound, so that the bleeding would essentially stop. Then the body would be stripped and dragged into the bathroom, hung upside down, and the blood would essentially drain from the body into the tub drain. Uh, then they would lay out a giant plastic tarp and dismember the body, and then the parts would be placed in other bags, and they would start dropping uh, body parts off, usually at the Fountain Avenue dump, which was owned by the Center family. So that's the Gemini method. Uh, everybody was involved in it. It's a little creepy. I can imagine that that place, which is still standing, it's no longer the Gemini Lounge, obviously, but uh, I bet you that place has got some, some nasty, haunting stuff going on in there. Um, so, essentially, at this point, the DeMeo crew is murdering, uh, murder for hire, selling drugs. They're also stealing a ton of cars from New York City, and what they're essentially doing is they're chopping up the cars, in some cases, and selling them for parts, but what they realized shortly after was that they could make a lot more money if they stole cars and shipped them overseas to Kuwait and Saudi Arabia to wealthy oil owners or sheiks or, or whatever, what, what might, whatever it may be, uh, and they're getting a ton of money for these cars. Uh, it's so what began as a simple one or two cars, uh, sending them overseas a month, became like three and 400 cars overseas a month. And it was very, very, very profitable. And, and to this day, I don't understand why they just didn't. I guess what I'm trying to say is you can continue to have your illegal rackets and everything else. But when you're making that kind of money and bringing it in, why are you still doing sloppy things? So, you know, it just, it's like the old saying, and I, I say this a lot, like, especially when somebody, you know, will bring up somebody like Pablo Escobar to me, not that that has anything to do with this, but how much is enough? You know, you, you have $14 billion, that's not enough? I mean, I, I would think, fuck, <laughs> 5 million would be enough for me. It, it's just the greed and the power, and what ends up happening nine times out of ten when you read these stories, and it's in every mob book you could ever read, every mob movie. Guy has a lot of rackets going, everything's great, and he gets sloppy. And in the case of Roy DeMeo, he went from possibly maybe murdering as, as a reaction of business to really murdering because he enjoyed it. And there's been a lot of mob guys that have been like that. Tommy Patera, murderer. I mean, my God, like a lot of people say this guy, Tommy Patera, was more of a serial killer than a mob guy. I'm not going to, I don't know if I agree or disagree with that statement, but when it goes from business to pleasure, there's a problem. And we're going to take a short break. When we come back, Roy DeMeo is going to start having major problems. <laughs> Thank you. 
And we're back on Mob Talk. Last we heard, Roy DeMay was going to start having some problems. And, and really kind of the the biggest issue and probably the single event that would end up sealing Roy DeMeo's fate was ultimately something that Chris Rosenberg did. Uh, Chris Rosenberg obviously uh, was calling himself Chris DeMeo in a lot of circles, and it was creating problems because anything that he did that was sloppy came back to Roy, got back to Nino, got back to Paul, and it became a problem. Uh, And the big event that took place was that uh, Chris Rosenberg ended up selling uh, kilos of coke, heroin. I just he was I don't want to say out of control, but he was probably moving a lot more weight than he should. And eventually, through his contacts, he ends up meeting two distributors distributors from the Cuban cartel, and he essentially meets two of these people in a hotel room. They flew up from Miami. And he meets them in a hotel room, and they're going to to start some sort of deal. Chris was to buy, like, I believe two kilos or a kilo of Coke. And instead, what he decides to do is kill them, murder them, essentially, leave their bodies in the hotel, and take the Coke and walk away. This creates a massive, massive, massive problem. Because when these two distributors don't show back up to Florida, the head guy of the Cuban cartel is irate. Uh, he wants answers and he essentially is going to come to New York, kill Chris Rosenberg, or he's going to launch a war on the Italian mafia. Uh, Paul Castellano ends up finding out about this, uh, exactly how I I believe there were some phone calls made and and it really became a problem because the mob did not want to take on a, a drug cartel. Uh, but what this gentleman who I believe his nickname was El Negro wanted in return was he wanted Chris Rosenberg shot. He wanted him splayed out photos, newspapers, headlines, magazines. He wanted this to be a public murder. So essentially Paul goes to Nino and tells Nino, Chris Rosenberg's got to go let Roy know. Roy doesn't want to do it. Roy loves Chris Rosenberg like a son and as sloppy as he got, Roy just didn't want to do it so eventually the heat gets turned up uh, enough so what Roy does is he takes a car and he uses machine guns against the car and tries to fake uh, the murder of Chris Rosenberg which does not pacify the Cuban cartel so once again it creates even more friction and ultimately uh, DeMeo is told you've, you've got to kill Chris, I mean, that's the end of it. And and what ends up happening is DeMeo gets really paranoid, very, very paranoid. Everybody that's Hispanic looking or could be a drug dealer or whatever, it just really starts to eat at him. And in his neighborhood, there was a young Hispanic man who was going door to door, uh, raising money for college tuition and et cetera. And Roy got so paranoid that it was a Cuban hit team. He pulled a weapon and started firing. Uh, ultimately, this kid is able to get away, gets in his car, starts flying down the streets, you know, heading towards Brooklyn. Uh, Roy and Joe Guglamit, who was it? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Roy and Joe get in the car and begin to, to chase him through the streets of Brooklyn, firing shots uh, at the other car while they drive. Eventually, they end up shooting him and killing him. And a few days later, you know, uh, well, prior to that, Roy packs up all his stuff and takes off and hides because he's he's par- he's paranoid. He's scared for his life. He's not sure what's going on. And a couple days later in the newspaper, it shows that the young man that they killed didn't have drug connections. He was just simply a kid that was trying to earn money to go to college. So Roy killed an innocent person over something that Chris Rosenberg did. So shortly after that. He calls Chris Rosenberg into a meeting and blows his head off and essentially ends Chris Rosenberg's life. But it created a real problem because not only was Roy not doing what Paul Castellano said, but it was appearing more and more that he was um, essentially out of control. In 1979, there was a problem that we like to call, at least I like to call the Apolito problem. 
Uh, if you recognize that name, it's because Jimmy Eppolito Sr. and Jr. were two uh, made Gambino members who were cousins of the disgraced New York uh, Police Department cop Louis Eppolito. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, you should look up the Mafia Cops, which was uh, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa who, at the behest of uh, Gaspipe Casso, killed a bunch of people. But they were related, essentially, to Louis Eppolito, uh, James Eppolito Sr. and Jr. And essentially, here's what happened. Uh, the Eppolitos went to Paul uh, and accused Nino Gaggi and DeMeo of drug dealing. Uh, Castellano, at the time, probably knew they were doing it, but at the same time, the profits were good enough. And he probably didn't want to make waves at that point. So essentially, uh, he sides with, with Gaji and DeMeo taking their side of it. And then in 1979, Gaji and DeMeo shot James Sr. and James Jr. Eppolito outside of the Gemini Lounge. But the problem was there was a witness that drove by and kind of saw something going on. And they immediately found a police officer, told the pol- the officer... And the officer headed to the scene. Uh, after shots had been fired, obviously DeMeo took off in another direction, and Nino Gaggi is still standing there. And he ends up getting out, getting into a shootout with the police over it. He was effectively arrested and charged with murder and attempted murder of a police officer for shooting his weapon at a cop. But DeMeo wasn't about to let Nino take the fall for anything, so DeMeo ended up finding the witness, killing the witness, and ended up bribing the jury. And Nino Gaggi, as a result, was conv- convicted only of assault and re- given a 5- to 15-year sentence. So once again, we see you know, Roy, Ma- Roy DeMeo go into to Nino Gaggi's defense, uh, but I don't think it was so much protecting Nino as so much as it was protecting himself. Uh, then in 1979 and 1980, the warehouse that Roy DeMeo was using for his cars, uh, they were essentially holding the cars in a warehouse uh, where they would chop them up or they would use parts or they would move them from one place to another. It gets raided by the FBI. Uh, then at the tail end of 81, uh, Freddie DeNome and Dirty Hair, <laughs> Dirty, this is why I just said this, uh, Henry Henry Borelli was called Dirty Henry because of his shooting ability. He was able to, to fire a firearm very well. So they called him Dirty Henry after Dirty Harry, and that's why I just kind of fudged that. But anyway, Freddie Genome and uh, Henry Borelli were arrested by uh, the FBI for their role in the car operation. There wasn't enough evidence to really charge anybody else. So DeMeo goes to Freddie and to Henry and says, listen, just do me a favor just plead guilty this investigation will stop you know i'll take care of your family or whatever but just please plead guilty then in 82 the fbi begins to sort of really watch roy DeMeo, and they're all over top of him uh they're they were investigating unsanctioned murders bodies drug dealing uh the murder of chris rosenberg the murder of danny grillo uh the the murder of um sherry golden uh and jonathan quinn uh they're essentially looking into everything that Roy DeMeo is doing, especially the car scheme. They, they were onto the car stuff, and it was just going to be a matter of time before they were able to pin something on Roy. So Paul Castellano starts to get a little nervous, and he had a reason to be. Um, the reason why Paul begins to come ner- become nervous is because whereas the money is great, now they're starting to get sloppy. They had an issue with the Eppolitos. They had an issue with... Chris Rosenberg. They had an issue with uh, Roy killing an innocent civilian who had nothing to do with the the Cuban uh, cartel crisis. So Roy is really starting to become a liability. Paul Castellano knew that in so many ways he could get tied into a lot of what Roy was doing. So the fear kind of became that if we don't do something about Roy and Roy can't handle the charges, what are the odds Roy's going to you know, flip a dime on us and, and snitch us out. So it started to become a real problem, and Roy DeMeo started to get very, very paranoid. Then it didn't help that there were wiretaps picked up on Angelo Ruggiero's line uh, between Angelo Ruggiero and Gene Gotti, who were talking about Paul Castellano sanctioning the murder of Roy DeMeo and that they had attempted, allegedly, at least from the wiretap that I've heard, uh, they essentially said that John Gotti had gotten the contract for DeMeo, but John Gotti didn't want to do it. He had respect for Roy DeMeo in the sense of he was a street guy. 
And at that point, Gotti was having his own problems with Castellano, which would root their ugly heads. And I, I, I really do think at the end of the day, a, a lot of it was uh, nobody was going to do anything for Castellano. It was his problem. Uh, he's the one that made these decisions, and he was on his own. As, as far as anybody could really give a shit at that point, he would be on his own, which would, would start a, a chasm of events that would ultimately lead to Castellano being killed outside Sparks Steakhouse in Lower Manhattan. But at the end of the day, uh, Castellano wants DeMeo totally gone. He's a problem. He's a liability. And it, he just has to go. He just has to go. So what ends up happening is... Uh, if you read Albert DeMeo's book, and Albert DeMeo is the son of Roy DeMeo, and he's there's the the book title I believe is called "For the Sins of My Father." Uh, it's a good read. I have some issues with some of it, uh, not particularly because I I feel like Albert DeMeo is lying and he says the word. I I just don't think he knew as much as he says he did. I think a lot of the information that he did have, however, sort of came from the FBI in the end. Uh. But that's neither here or there. It's a good read, at least from the perspective of Roy DeMeo's son. It kind of gives you sort of a look into Roy DeMeo's life, especially towards the end when he starts to get paranoid. Uh, he had a plan to leave the country, a plan to, to escape, uh, and, and everything like that. And he sort of took uh, his son Albert under his wing and, and, and told him a lot of things he probably shouldn't have, things that probably cause nightmares for Albert today. Uh, but at the end result is is that and there's two different stories. The, the The first story is is that Rory was lured to a house. They shot him in the kitchen. That's not true. That's not what happened. What you're about to hear is exactly what happened verbatim. Uh, Roy was summoned to one of the garages that they operated out of. Okay, And as he enters the garage, he gets out of the car. He's immediately shot by Nino Gaggi, Anthony Center, and Joey Testa. Uh, one of the things that lends itself to the fact that Roy was caught off guard was that he put his hands up in front of his face because there were bullet holes in his hands. Uh, then they stuff him in the trunk. They drop the car off a couple blocks away. Roy DeMeo is fine, found weeks later, uh, rotting. So the question becomes, why exactly did Roy DeMeo go to this meeting? And, and to this day, I don't understand. And this is, this is, this is why I argue against Albert's book is that if Roy was planning to leave and he had already set in motion plans for this, how to move this, how to move that, why does he go to the meeting? He knows at the end of the day, he knows he's going to get killed. And if he has all of these plans to abscond and leave and get away, why doesn't he just do it? Why the hell does he go to a meeting? He didn't trust anybody at that point. He had grown a beard at one point, disappeared for months at a time. So why does he go to that meeting it doesn't make any sense and that's the problem i have with albert's book is that the way he structures it is that you know his father had planned to leave he knew this was coming and he was all about saving himself and his family and his kids and etc but yet he goes to the meeting anyway you know maybe in the end maybe roy just said you know what it doesn't matter what i do at this point they're going to come after me you know and ultimately Roy's crimes and the things that Roy did ultimately led to the indictment of Paul Castellano in the commission case. And one of the things that Anthony Center and Joey Testa did was that they had inserted sort of a tape recording device in Roy's trunk to make it look like Roy was taping conversations. And it was probably done so in a way to make the FBI sort of look sideways at it saying, well, wow, was this guy an informant? Was he a CI? Because for years, people have said that Roy DeMeo was giving information to the FBI. That's totally bullshit. It's not true. That's not even why he was killed. He was killed for transgressions of other things. But ultimately, it wasn't just Roy DeMeo that got Paul Castellano caught up. It got, it got Paul caught up in the commission case, but then ultimately Dominic Montiglio would flip and, you know, Nino Gaggi goes to jail for the rest of his life. Paul gets indicted for more stuff. But it was Paul's decision that I bet you he regretted to the last seconds of his life. Because if DeMeo doesn't get reckless at any point, if he just stays on point, keeps his rackets going, doesn't get too far into the wind, this doesn't become a problem. But not only does Roy make 
pinhead decisions about who he brings around. Because it's like a, it's almost like a, a domino effect. You know, you got Roy. Okay, so Chris is going to screw up. Then Roy's going to screw up. Then Roy's really going to screw up. And so it, it creates an event or a set of circumstances Roy can avoid. And maybe that's, maybe that's at the end of the day why he, why he went to the meeting. He justified that, you know what, this is it. This is what's going to happen to me. So be it. And one of the things that happens after Roy is found dead is that Anthony Center, at least according to Albert DeMeo, Anthony Center and Joey Testa tried to kill Albert DeMeo for Roy's book. They wanted, they wanted Roy's Shylock book. They wanted all the customer names. Now, whether or not that's true, I'm not really sure. But I think there is one thing that definitely proves that that could be a stretch. I'm not saying that Anthony Center and Joey Testa were not capable of doing that because, believe me, they were. Because Anthony Center went from uh, just a regular car thief to a junkie and an absolute murder machine. But at the end of the day, what lends itself to that being sort of a stretch, at least from two perspectives. Let's take the first one. After Nino Gaggi goes away, Castellano, we know what happens with him. Center and Testa sort of go and start doing hits for, for Gaspipe Casso. They sort of attach themselves to the Lucchese crime family. So it's not a stretch to believe that Casso didn't say to them, hey, I want that book. We want to take over his Shylock. But I would think that the Gambinos would have a problem with that because that was, that was Gambino business, not Lucchese business. So that's the first thing that kind of makes me say, I'm uh, not sure about that. The second one is nobody in the Gambino family would allow Anthony Center and Joey Testa, who were not made guys, they were associates, to go after Roy DeMeo's son. So the next question is, why would they have gone after Albert to begin with? Well, the problem was Albert knew a lot. He knew all his father's loan shark customers. He knew what people owed. You know, and, and I'm sure that to, to some extent, Albert wanted revenge. He certainly didn't like Anthony Center. He's made that well known his entire life. But I just have a hard time believing that the Gambinos would allow Anthony Center and Joey Testa, who were unmade guys, just associates, to, eat, to, to even go after a kid like that. But apparently, as the story goes, they ran him off the road. His car went to a ravine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, apparently, he took some threats from Anthony Center as well. So that's kind of the story of Roy DeMeo. You know, it's sort of this uh, meteoric rise from being a, a, a child that was bullied because he was overweight to taking what he knew how to do, which was be tough, turn a profit, turn it into a racket, have a bunch of illegal rackets, climb the mob ladder, but then get sloppy. Gets sloppy. Now, you notice there is one name I did not mention throughout this whole entire thing, and someone's invariably going to bring it up to me, and that's Richard Kuklinski. And the reason why people like to bring that up is because for some fucking reason, Richard Kuklinski is attached to Roy DeMeo like the plague, like a scab. So let me make this very clear. Richard Kuklinski was not a mob guy. Richard Kuklinski did not work for Roy DeMeo. Richard Kuklinski did not do mob hits for mob families. Richard Kuklinski was a fucking serial killer who had an imagination like Santa Claus. This guy not only failed every polygraph he ever took, but even the FBI said they couldn't believe a word. They believed he had hundreds of victims. Yeah, that's fine. Here or there. This is a guy who got into business with the fucking ice cream guy and was killing people for fun. He put a guy in a cave, tied him down, and let the rats eat him alive in videotape. That's not a mob hit. That's just some sick, sinister shit. That's some Jeffrey Dahmer type of shit. There is zero proof Richard Kuklinski ever had any... Name one mob guy Richard Kuklinski killed. Name one mob guy. Can't do it, can you? Maybe there's one. And that's an iffy thing. But that was over a personal beef that had nothing to do with mob business. That had to do with somebody owed money. And that's why Richard Kuklinski shotgunned the motherfucker. But Richard Kuklinski had nothing to do with the mob, nothing to do with anybody. He even inserted himself in, 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 in the Nick Scabetta hit or, or the DB hit with Sammy Gravano. It's all bullshit. Nobody's ever heard of Richard Kuklinski outside of New Jersey. 
The FBI doesn't buy anything he said. So stop inserting Richard Kuklinski into the mafia. He also, hey, listen, if you listen to this prick long enough, he'll tell you where Jimmy Hoff is buried. Because he, he was in on that too. You do the dates, they just, they just don't match up. They don't match up. All right, so, and final, and I am going to tell a story. I decided I'm going to tell it. I may go over my time limit. I just want to thank everybody for actually listening to the show. I don't say that enough. I want to say hello to Deary. She knows who she is. Uh, and a bunch of other people know who they are. My attorney, the bulldog. And Deary, of course. I said that twice. But So how do I know Anthony Center? And I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. Uh, I met Anthony Center never personally. So because I know there's going to be people that are coming. How did you meet him? He's been in prison since '89. Whatever. How do you know? How do you know him? I met him strangely enough through somebody else that didn't even have anything to do with him. I was doing legal paperwork for a guy named Keith Mawuli Benjamin, who was convicted in the '70s of killing a cop, and and I was working on his case file for him, uh, just as a hobby or whatever. Uh, and through him, I met Anthony Center. I guess they got to talk, and he said, hey, I know this guy. You know, he's doing a lot of legal work for me. He's really helping me out. Turns out the guy, Keith Benjamin, who was wrongly convicted, and I, and I don't say that like tongue-in-cheek. He really was. He really was wrongly convicted, and thank God he got out of prison. He had, he had a life sentence, and I helped get him out. That's one of the biggest highlights of my life is being able to help somebody to the point where a court will actually open up the case and say, wait a minute, something's fucking rotten here. And he got out and he went back home and his life is great. And that's like really one of the highlights of my life. But anyhow, through him, I met Anthony Center. You know, we exchanged a couple of letters here and there. This is who I know. This is who I know at the time. I was also uh, friendly with Carmine Persico. So that's noted. So, you know, my name kind of got tossed around a lot of prison guys, and it seemed like it was all mob guys and some other people, too, that I knew. But uh, the end of it is, is that I sort of got involved with Anthony, helping him on his case and stuff like that. Uh, and through him, I met Angela Clemente, who is renowned for exposing the Greg Scarpa files with the FBI, uh, which sort of kind of leads into why I had issues with the FBI and Jerry Capici to begin with. But I don't want to tell that whole story. But the end of it is, Anthony and I were very, very friendly uh, for years. Uh, and I was working on stuff with him. It's not that I thought he was wrongly convicted. There was just some some stuff that was, from the FBI's perspective, a little off. So yeah, I was willing to help the guy. He seemed pretty nice. Uh, but then something kind of happened. I noticed with some of these guys, and it's not all, because believe me, I never had a terse word with Carmine Persco in my life, my God, you know, but Anthony was an incredibly volatile guy, uh, get upset over nothing, but, but the long end of it is, is that there was something going on, and I've got to be real careful here, but there was something going on between him and Angela Clemente, sort of off the record, they, I don't know if it was like a love thing, or whatever it was, but I was told not to let Anthony know that I was having telephone conversations with Angela. And effectively, I let it slip. Uh, and next thing I know, I get this card from him. And it's the weirdest thing. You want to talk like, like out of a movie? I get this card in the mail. It was right around Christmas time. And, you know, obviously it's from Anthony Center, blah, blah, blah. At the time he was doing time in Beaumont, Texas. And I open it up and it's a very very cool card it's got like a schoolhouse with a horse and there's an arrow pointing in the schoolhouse there's an arrow pointing out of the schoolhouse towards the edge of the cart saying and then it says like your way this way and so i kind of looked at it i'm like that's kind of tongue-in-cheek is he telling me to get lost then i open the card and from the top to the bottom the amount of profanities the amount of scumbag this that and the third he was very angry at, at what I have no fucking idea. Even today, I, I still don't, I still do not know. But apparently, Anthony didn't want anybody talking to Angela. I was just trying to help the guy. So I guess when you're in prison, that's sort of the mentality that you do take. Uh, he's the only one I ever had that problem with. Uh, there are some other ones that are more, you know, Anthony's from that cloth that the mafia doesn't exist. 
the mafia doesn't exist. Don't even say that word. Don't even say this word. Don't even say that word. And so ultimately, I think what led to my uh, – how do I want to say this? What led to my interaction with the FBI was that it was through Anthony Center, Angela Clemente, Carmine Persco. I guess my name just started getting filtered, and then there was the stuff with Capisci. So that probably makes all sense. I've spent years trying to figure this out. But that's how I knew Anthony Center, and he was uh, a decent guy, I guess. He wasn't really book smart, uh, but he was – I got to give him credit. I mean he's cut from an old cloth. The mob doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Don't put that word in your mouth. you know. Uh, but for people that do write – and this is just – I'm going to give some advice here. I wrote to these guys young, when I was young. Uh, not because I was infatuated, but because I come from, uh, how to say this too, I, I come from a certain area, a certain place in my life where I'm connected with people, people know me, I know them, related to people, all of that being said. So I kind of get a shoe in with people because people know who I was related to and et cetera, et cetera. So it gives me sort of an end that a lot of people don't have. Uh, and I would just ask questions. I would like to pick their brains because – even if you morally disagree with what a lot of these guys do, you have to admit there's a lot of sophistication. They're highly intelligent people. So I like to pick people's brains about history, and I like to pick people's brains about their intelligence, like what makes them do this or, or makes them do that. You know, So it's never a, hey, can I have your autograph so I can slam it on my wall type of stuff. It was always very personal stories uh, and, and picking brains. That's all it was about. So if you're going to go down that road and you're going to write to these guys, I'm going to give you a warning straight up because this is reality. Don't tell people personal stories. Don't tell people personal information. If you're interested in one certain thing, ask them. Just be blunt about it. But you have to understand it's a give and it's a give and it's a take. You know, if you're asking for something, they're going to want something back from you, be it dumping money into their canteen or, or sending them magazines if they ask or whatever. So just know that ahead of time. It's not as easy, simple as just, hey, I'm going to write this guy. He's going to write me back and everything's going to be beautiful. That's not how it works. you know. So if, if you're going to get involved in this genre at all and you, you think that it's a good decision, think it through. Send them a letter and see what you can get. But they're not going to tell you anything. You're not going to get anything of substance. You never will, especially from the old-time guys. They're just, they're just not going to do that. They're cut from a different cloth. And from, by all means, don't, don't, don't consider them friends. You don't know these people. They're, they're in jail. One of the things that really, I think, bites at me about people that do this is they do it, and then they get creeped out or scared, and they read in between the lines. You know, Everybody thought I was crazy. My whole family thought I was crazy. My grandfather, my uncle, what the fuck are you doing writing this guy? What are, you, what are you hoping to get? Nothing. I just was interested in, in how their brain worked. I was interested in, in who they were as a person outside of headlines. And that's, that's the last thing I'm going to hit on. And I'm going to get the fuck out of here. You can pick somebody's brain for so long. <laughs> but the one thing you have to do, if you're even going to go this direction, just get to the point. Know what you want to know and let it go. I really, you know what? I just got lost in my own fucking thoughts. I really thought I was going somewhere with that, but apparently I'm not. I'm hoping it comes back to me here in the next 20 seconds. Huh. I don't think it's going to. Congratulations. I've had a brain fight today. But listen, it's, it's been a good show, and I apologize if we didn't get, if I sort of raced through stuff. It's my first show back. Cut me some fucking slack. I need a little fucking slack over here today. So we're going to come back next week with Gas Pipe. He's, uh, <laughs> you know, I have a joke with, with, the, with a friend of mine on Facebook about this. Is we like to make fun of Nicky Scarfo all the time because he's just so fucking batshit crazy. And he did hilarious things. I mean, they're gruesome shit, don't get me wrong, but it's hilarious in an uncomfortable way. You know, especially like when Nicky Scarfo is riding a horse and the horse goes off the course and runs into a tree. Nicky gets so fucking irate that he has the horse taken up to a cliff and he pushes the horse off the cliff because the horse did it intentionally, you know. Stuff like that I like to laugh at. But it's like stuff Gas Pipe says I like to laugh at. And I think it's because some of the shit that Gas Pipe has said and will continue to say behind the wall it's pretty, it's pretty epic and it's, it's funny. The guy's a psychopath. Don't get me wrong in any stretch of the imagination here. But 
I, I sort of laugh at some of the stuff because there there are there are guys that are quiet, and then there are guys that are like outrageously loud and crazy at the same time, and that's kind of the stuff that uh, that's kind of the stuff I'm into. I don't know. And Nicky Scarfo cracks me up. He always has. Anyway, so that's the show. We're gonna come back next week with Gas Pipe Casso. Uh, feel free to send all your threats, your hatred, your slander, your libel, your name calling, because that's what I get. Send it all to Real Mob Talk Seven, and that's on Twitter. Or you can assault me verbally on Facebook, or you can assault me verbally on Google Plus. Because it's amazing. You guys always figure out how the fuck to get a hold of me and 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 just say the right thing. So anyway. I want everybody to have a good weekend and uh, keep coming back. The shows are going to get better. I do have some guests coming up on future shows here shortly. So just keep on reeling it in, dialing it in with me, and uh, I'll continue to give you the truth as I always do. Remember, you're not going to get nothing but the truth here. Uh, and, and we're also going to do some historical shows as well because a lot of people like mob history, so we'll get into that too. So thanks a lot for listening in. Have a good weekend, and uh, don't forget to look over your shoulders when you walk.